Hi, my name is Maddie Heredia. I'm a land manager and outreach specialist for the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves, and this presentation is titled Fire Management, a Comprehensive Lesson Comparing Wild and Prescribed Fire. Um, so I mentioned that uh, I work for the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves, and before we get into the presentation, I kind of want to do a Cliff Notes version of who we are and what we do. Um, we are an agency that works for state government. We are in the Energy and in Environment Cabinet. And here's a list of our duties and our statutes. And to sum all of this up, my agency purchases land to protect it because it has rare and endangered species on it. It's biologically diverse or it's a great recreational opportunity for the general public. This is a map depicting all of the properties that we have involvement in across the state through our various programs at Kentucky Nature Preserves. And in total, Kentucky Nature Preserves has involvement in about 130,000 acres across the state. Our staff is very diverse. Uh, we have a biological assessment team and their job is to go out onto all these properties and find out what's there, do inventories and surveys, as well as monitor for um, rare and endangered species. Our natural areas branch is tasked with manipulating the land um, to create the best habitat for those rare and endangered species. We also have an environmental education program, um, and this has been pretty much halted since COVID-19, but we're really excited for when we can gather again and conduct programs like this when it's safe. Um, and lastly, all of that data that we collect on rare, sensitive, um, threatened and endangered species goes into our database, which is made uh, publicly available on our website through our KYBAT tool. So now we're gonna get into fire. Um, today we're gonna compare and contrast the similarities and differences between wildfire and prescribed fire. So by definition, wildfire is a large uncontrolled inferno that burns and spreads quickly through wild landscapes. And the key words to take away from this definition are uncontrolled and uh, wild. <laughs> On the other hand, prescribed fire, sometimes called a controlled burn, is fire applied in a knowledgeable manner to fuels on specific land areas under selected weather conditions to accomplish predetermined, well-defined management objectives. And that is a very long-winded, complex, and um, detailed definition because prescribed fire itself is a very complex and detailed process. So, we're gonna talk about wildfire first, and I want to take a second and just let that term sit with you. So when you hear the word, the word wildfire, what comes to mind? What images come to mind, and what words do you associate it with? And for a lot of us, we might imagine images similar to these. Words that are similar to dangerous, climate change, uncontrollable, devastating consequences. And in today's climate, that's all very true. But let's back it up a little bit and try to understand how does a fire get to this point? How does it get this large and uncontrollable? And to understand that, we need to understand the fire triangle and fire itself. So the fire triangle is a model that shows the three key components that fire needs to be able to sustain itself. And so we're gonna look at this um, with wildfire in mind. So the first thing in no particular order that fire needs to sustain itself is a fuel source. And in a wildland setting, there, Mother Nature provides us with so many different types of fuel. Um, if you can see in, oh, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> This image is depicting leaf litter fuel. So in any forest, um, you know, when fall time comes, trees go through a process called leaf senescence when their, you know, their leaves change pretty colors and they drop them to the ground. And over time, that leaf litter builds up on the forest floor and creates great fuel. 
The second fuel we're going to talk about is, is a little bit of a heavier fuel. And when I'm talking about heavier fuel, I mean that when it burns, it's going to burn for longer. And so these types of fuels are sticks that have fallen from the trees, whole branches and limbs, um, entire trees that are dead and decomposing on the forest floor. Next, we have uh, a different fuel type. This is pretty unique. Not all fuel needs to be dead and dried out. So a lot of our pine and cedar species have oils in their leaves that are highly flammable. And so if fire does get into those, those canopies, it's called a crown fire, uh, depending on the forest type, it's a, if it's a pine forest, which a lot of the fires out in California are, it's able to sustain itself and move across the canopy, which is pretty dangerous. And lastly, one of our finest fuels is um, grass. And so that field right there might look very different in the growing season. It could be green and lush, and it won't carry fire very well because it's moist. But in the dormant season, you've got all these tall, thin, dry, dead grasses that are very combustible, and fire can rip through that landscape pretty quickly. The next thing fire needs to sustain itself is heat or an ignition source. And so in a wildfire setting, that can come from the sun in extreme um, climate conditions, dry and hot weather. It can also come from a lightning strike, or it can be human-induced, meaning arson, a spark from a piece of farming equipment, a campfire that might have not been extinguished properly and put out all the way, Lastly, fire needs oxygen to sustain itself. And in a wildland setting, um, there is an endless supply of that. And the unique thing about the fires that we saw on the previous sli slides is when a fire gets that large and powerful, it can sometimes create its own unstable atmospheric conditions because it's sucking in oxygen from all directions. And so I added this picture of this really cool phenomenon called a fire whirl. Um, and when you see those, it's a, it's a pretty hot and dangerous fire. So the causes of wildfire in the US today are 90% human induced through campfires, arson, cigarettes, sparks from machines, everything that we had mentioned before. And only 10% of fires in the US today are due to natural causes. Um, so extreme weather patterns or conditions, dry and hot conditions, climate change. And so when we think of wildfires, we tend to think of California or more recently Australia, but wildfires occur all over the world um, and the US and even in Kentucky. And so this is a map that the Kentucky Division of Forestry created that shows all of the wildfires that were documented from 2008 to 2017. And if we were in person, I would ask, you know, what can you infer from this map? And something that I look at at this map is this big black whole of where there's not that many wildfires compared to the rest of the state. And we can infer why that is. Um, you know, what is in that area? We have Louisville, we have Lexington, we have expansion from cities. We also have a lot of farmland, um, not a lot of wildland fuels. In comparison, if you look at the southeast, there are a ton of wildfires in this area. And surprisingly, surprisingly to me, <laughs> they're mostly caused by arson. Um, but the reason I think that there are so many wild, more wildfires in this area is there's so much more connected fuel. Um, there's more opportunity for it to start and go unnoticed and become um, a big uncontrollable wildfire. And so now that we've talked about wildfire, we're gonna switch gears and talk a little bit more about prescribed fire, which as you recall is a controlled burn um, applied in a knowledgeable manner to, with specific uh, parameters to accomplish predetermined, well-defined management objectives. 
And so what are these objectives or goals? Why would we purposely set fire to a wild landscape? Well, there are many reasons that we want to put fire on a wild landscape. It enhances wildlife habitat. Many species of plants um, depend on it for seed germination. There's also specific species of plants that depend on fire in, in order to germinate. And when I say germinate, it's just the process of when a seed is rooting and, um, and sprouting and becoming a seedling. And so there's a specific species that has um, their seeds are sealed in resin and fire is needed to break that seal in order for them to germinate. And without fire, they wouldn't survive. Another reason that we wanna put prescribed fire on the ground is for fuel reduction. We talked about leaves um, on the forest floor and trees dropping their leaf litter and all this fuel that falls to the forest floor over time. Wildfire used to run through our landscapes prior to our settlement. And so once humans were introduced into the picture, we began suppressing fire. And so all that leaf litter, all that fuel that was on that forest floor now has the opportunity to build up over time and just create a huge bed of fuels. And so when that catches fire, it's 10 times more dangerous. Um, so to try to prevent that, you can do routine prescribed fires through the landscapes to try to minimize that fuel. Every couple of years, go in and burn it and try to reduce some of that so that it does not become those catastrophic fires that we saw in the first slide. Now, this won't prevent wildfires. Um, wildfires will always exist. We always have conditions for it, and they're becoming increasingly more dangerous with climate change. But it will help the, in help the intensity and um, make them a little bit easier to control. Prescribed fire can also be used to control unwanted species and invasive species. Um, in this picture down here, we are using prescribed fire on one of our nature preserves to try to remove some of those cedars that are not supposed to be growing in a, a woodland savanna kind of open canopy habitat. And lastly, prescribed fire can be used to promote disturbance for the species that depend on it and promote native vegetation. There's a lot of species, especially in the bluegrass region, that depend on this open canopy system. Um, and without fire to create disturbance through the landscape periodically, um, a lot of woody species kind of take, open, take over these open grasslands. And without fire to knock them back every couple of years, the, the forbs and the grassland species and all the species that are growing on the forest floor um, would not be able to survive. And so I talked about fire um, not being a new concept and wildfire running through the landscape over many, many, many years. And so I just want to look at our biodiversity in Kentucky and show you what Kentucky used to look like prior to European settlement. And so in this map, you can see many habitat types. Um, and those habitat types are broken down even further based on geology and soils. But for our purposes, we're just going to look at these. And grasslands were a lot more prevalent back then. Wetlands were a lot more prevalent back then. And we had a lot more connected pre-settlement forest land. And so Kentucky now looks drastically different. Um, and we lost a lot of our habitat types and our habitat coverage. And a lot of it is um, due to farming, urban sprawl, coal mining, as you can see in that photo. And when we lost all of that, that habitat, we also lot of the, lost a lot of the species diversity that came with it. So what are some of the causes of that habitat loss? Well, we already talked about settlement, um, farming, urban sprawl, loss of routine disturbance, such as fire suppression that I touched on a little bit earlier. Um, another thing that causes disturbance um, that kind of does the same thing as fire uh, is large mammal migrations. And so prior to European settlement, we had large bison migrations that would run through the landscape that really depended on disturbance. Um, and before that, the mastodons. And we don't, we don't have that anymore. Um, and lastly, uh, invasive species, the introduction of those. This picture down here 
is a woodland edge habitat. And that bright green plant is called Japanese honeysuckle. And as you can see, it has completely taken over the mid understory. So under those green bushy plants, there's not a lot of sunlight. And so anything that was on that forest floor um, that used to exist is not getting the sun it's needed and it's gonna be outcompeted. And so one of the main habitats impacted by European settlement were these open canopy systems. And that's because when you, when settlers came to this land, you know, if, if you saw a wooded forest and an open grassland, you're gonna make your farm in the open grassland. You're not gonna do a bunch of work to chop down a forest to make a farm. So these open grasslands have really suffered because um, a lot of them have been converted into farming. Um, and with that, we lost a lot of the species that thrived in those open canopy systems. And so the loss of this habitat equals the loss and reductions in the species that depend on it. And some of those species, I'm not just talking about plants. I know I focus a lot on plants because plants are the base of the ecosystem that make up um, what everything else depends on. And so some examples of some of these species that are in decline or hurting because of the loss of this habitat are monarch butterflies. Um, they are an endangered species candidate, but they depend on one specific plant called milkweed um, to complete their life cycles. And this milkweed only grows in this open canopy system. Um, another really, really cool um, animal close to my heart is this eastern slender glass lizard and it's state threatened and so this is such a cool animal it's not a snake it's a lizard it's a limbless lizard um, I would die happy if I could see one of these but they're uh, historically found in these open canopy systems as well we also have many rare uh, threatened and endangered plants that have suffered from the loss of this habitat um, small white lady slipper is globally rare and state endangered. Shorts goldenrod is globally rare and state endangered. And shining lady tresses is state threatened. So the key to maintaining and restoring what is left of these open canopy systems is disturbance. Um, I kind of touched on this a little bit before, but if these habitats don't have disturbance, woody species will outcompete it. So for example, if we look at this picture with all the bison running through it, we have this beautiful open grassland and on the edge, we have a lot of woody forested habitat. These bison come and routinely graze on this and migrate through this land um, and eat all of the woody um, species and forbs that you know, might start to pop up in here. Well, when you take bison out of the picture, um, you've taken all the woody suppression out of, uh, out of the picture too. And so that grassland will eventually be converted into an early successional forest. Fire does a very similar job. We don't have bison anymore. Um, we can't <laughs> let a bunch of bison loose on our landscape. So we use prescribed fire to create the same type of disturbance that these habitats need. And so here's an example of a forest that is kind of early successional. It is, does not have disturbance or any management compared to um, a forest on the right that has had management, um, fire, or disturbance. And so if you look on the left, we have all these these mid understory species starting to crowd out um, the mid and understory and shade out the forest floor. And it's a very, it's a very dense, thick forest floor. You're not gonna be able to walk through it easily. On, on the contrast, we have the right that's been managed. And as you can see, there's a lot of green lush forbs and forest floor uh, dwelling species that are thriving in this habitat. And so, the problem with removing disturbance out of the equation is it allows a lot of, you know, in, in a forest, everything's comp competing for light. 
Um, and without this disturbance, it allows a lot of shade tolerant in, uh, species to thrive. Um, and when that shade tolerant species uh, is present, it tends to take over the mid and understory, shading out everything underneath um, and making that, fo that forest harder to burn in the future because those shade tolerant species, their leaf litter is not as, as flammable as shade intolerant species. So an example of specific habitats that depend on fire that we have here in Kentucky, um, one is the shortleaf pine system. Uh, we have some properties in the southeast that we're trying to restore shortleaf pine forests on. And the interesting thing about this species of tree is that it is, it is fire dependent. Um, there are so many studies and research shown that this species of tree has many traits that prove um, fire is part of its life cycle. So these traits give this species the advantage when uh, a, a wildfire ran through the landscape historically. Um, so for example, if a wildfire ran through this landscape, a lot of the oaks and its competing species were not able to survive. And that gave shortleaf pine the opportunity to grow up and be mature and be the dominant tree in that, in that forest. Well, when you take fire out of the equation, it no longer has this upper edge. And so all those other species outcompete it and there's not that many shortleaf pines left. Another example, um, a specific example of a property that depends heavily on prescribed fire is one of our sites called Crooked Creek State Nature Preserve in Lewis County. Um, and this is a, a more open canopy system. It's a, it's a oak barren community and on the left, you can see that we burned once in 2002. There's still a lot of woody stems and species that are trying to grow in this open habitat. And then on the right, we burned again in 2010. And that leaf that kind of looks like a shovel is called prairie dock. And it's actually a really great indicator species that this habitat used to be once more open than it was today. So there's little clues that we can we can find in our habitats and our landscapes that tell us that this land used to be something else. And that kind of helps us justify and try to convert it back to that. And so here's what Crooked Creek looks like today. And there's a, here's a lot of photos of the species that, um, that benefit from this habitat. Again, you can see that there's you know, there's still forest edge and there's still a few cedars and that's fine. That's the type of habitat um, that we want. However, if we were to completely let this property go, not do anything to it, uh, never look back, these cedars eventually would take over and you would not have any of this grassland habitat. So fire gets a bad rap. And it's understandable, especially if we go back and we look at those pictures that we saw in the very beginning of our presentation. Um, but again, I want to reiterate that it's not a new concept. Putting fire on the ground to promote, um, you know, native species is not a new concept. There's historical vegetation that shows and proves that, you know, fire was on this landscape at one time. And like we saw with the shortleaf pine, some species absolutely need fire to exist. We have records in current vegetation that show us that, you know, fire was on this landscape. Um, in this bottom right corner, you can see a tree ring. Um, and I'm sure you are all familiar with this, this, is how you can tell the age of trees. But you can also tell a lot more than just the age of the tree. You can tell when it had a lot of stressors in its life. Um, based on how far the rings are apart, if it was able to grow a lot during that season or less. Um, and you can also see these big black rings and these are fire scars. And so you can take a cross section of a tree and tell exactly like there was a fire, a wildfire or prescribed fire in 1843 here and then again in 1856. And lastly, um, indigenous people and the Native Americans used fire. Um, there's lots of history and records that show that they used fire to help uh, promote the growth of their crops on the landscape. And so another reason I think that fire gets a bad rep is people don't necessarily understand it that much and there's, there's a lot of questions. Um, and so 
you know, one of the biggest things is, you know, what, what happens to animals during fire? Um, are the plants okay? Like you're burning them up, like what happens to them? Well, we seasonally plan our fires to have the, to make the, to have the least amount of impact on the native species that habit that land. Um, and so surprisingly, a lot of the species um, burrow. And so they are well adapted. Uh, like I said, fire's been running through this landscape for years and their species are okay. They've been able to survive. They have a way to escape. Um, birds can move, uh, insects can fly away, uh, turtles, snakes, small uh, mammals, they can all burrow underground. Another thing we do when we're planning our fires is we provide refugia, meaning if we have a giant property um, and we want to conduct a prescribed fire on it, we're not going to burn the entire thing at one time. We're going to burn sections. Maybe we burn a couple acres over here this year, and then the next year we burn a couple acres over here. And that allows refuge for insects and reptiles and amphibians and small mammals to get away and still have habitat. Um, so we're not just burning up all of their homes. Um, and then the lastly, the last thing I kind of touched on already was adaptation. Um, this is not a new concept for them either and they've been dealing with this for years. And so another thing that's important to uh, understand is it's a process. It's, you know, the picture here on the left is during the prescribed fire, after, it looks pretty terrible, you know, especially on some of these public places that we do prescribed fire. Uh, we get so many phone calls saying like, what did you do? It looks terrible, but it's a process and it's gonna take a while before you get the results of um, this picture on the right, which is, this was taken just one growing season after the fire and it's already, flourishing with a bunch of um, native species for pollinators. So the other thing about prescribed fire is that there is so much planning that goes into it. If we think back to that really long complex definition, um, we try to manage for everything. Uh, we don't leave anything up to chance that day. We have contingency plans. We notify the fire department. Our staff is very well trained and educated. Um, we know what type of habitat we're burning. We know about the fuels. There's so much research that goes into the fuels and um, there's an entire academic like, discipline related, dedicated to fire science. You can get a PhD in fire science. It's, it's such uh, an interesting um, thing to study. So the first thing we do is we identify our location and goals. Um, we don't just put fire on the ground because it's pretty and it's fun and it looks cool. <laughs> we burn it for reasons. And some of those reasons I mentioned um, earlier, you know, habitat restoration, seed germination, helps with invasive species, um, fuel reduction. And so those are some of our goals um, that we identify in the very beginning. We also pick a site. Um, when I talked about refugia for insects, we, we got to map out exactly where that fire is going to be and exactly where we're going to contain it. And we're not going to burn this, but we're going to burn this. Um, so some of our, our goals uh, written down as objectives, something that's measurable, because um, science needs to be measurable, because you need to be able to look back on it and say, did this work? Did it not? Why? Um, and so for an example, one of our burn plans might say, our goal is for 80% 80 con 80 consumption of fuels, 30% um, top kill of woody species. Um, and that goes into a burn plan. Um, so this is identifying the site. Um, we don't just put fire on the ground and hope it stays where we want, we want it to. We create this thing called a fire break. Um, and so that's depicted on this map by the red line. So everything within those red boxes is going to be burned and everything outside of them is going to be excluded. And a break is exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's a break in the fuels. So if you look on the right, this is one of my coworkers lighting off of the break, which is this big mown path right here. And as you can see, when he puts the fire on the ground, it's it's traveling into the fuels. Um, it doesn't really have anywhere to go uh, because we have removed the fuels. Um, here's another picture. This is another coworker that's installing the fuels. And so when we light fire, this is gonna be the, 
you know, the, the unit, and this is going to be everything that we're going to try to avoid. And so these breaks need to be pretty well established and, and large and down to bare dirt because we don't want any fire trickling out and, you know, catching the neighbor's field on fire or some, somewhere we don't want fire to be. And so we're going to revisit our friend, the fire triangle, again, but this time we're going to look at it um, talking about prescribed fire. So when we talked about fuel um, and all the different types, in a prescribed fire, we research those fuel types. We, we learn about, you know, what kind of fire behavior are we going to get if we burn this type of fuel. Again, it's an entire education, educational discipline. Um, heat. We are providing the heat source. Um, this tool right here that um, this person is using is called a drip torch. And inside that canister, there's a mixture of diesel and gasoline. And it's a controlled way to put fire on the ground. It looks like a flamethrower. It's not. It literally just drips little drops of fire as you go. Um, so that fire that is behind her uh, is all that's just burning fuel. That's all on its own. We didn't throw gasoline on that. <laughs> Um, and lastly, oxygen. So we try to, we, in the fire triangle, we, control, we try to control everything in a fire. Um, unfortunately, we can't control the weather, uh, the wind direction, the wind speed, uh, the, the rate of which the oxygen is being carried into the fire. However, we can, we have great technology to predict weather, um, and we can plan ahead for that. So. Um, when we write a prescribed fire burn plan or a prescription, um, you know, if there's a road or a lot of houses that are going to be affected, if the wind pours smoke or pushes fire that way, we won't burn. Um, so in this sense, we can't control the oxygen aspect of the fire triangle, but we can plan ahead to have the best results. And here's an example of something that, you know, I will look at before I go out to a um, prescribed burn. It's got, it's got your relative humidity, the, the wind chill, the temperature, the wind speed, the direction. How many days has it been since it's rained? How many days after the fire is it going to rain immediately after? Is it going to be still really dry conditions that could be dangerous? Um, so there, hours and hours and days and weeks are spent planning prescribed fires. We even think about not just the fire itself, but the smoke. Um, is the smoke going to be pushed out onto a road that's super hazardous, hazardous for people driving on it? Um, are there any schools or places where there's large gatherings where smoke might be an issue uh, if it travels that direction? Um, we plan ahead for all of these things. And so all of those factors that I talked about and much more, because I can't get into every single one of them, go into a burn plan is what it's called. And so like a doctor prepares a prescription for a patient for specific results, a prescribed fire has a science-based prescription prepared for it. And that's what we call it for. Uh, we, that's what we call it, a prescription. And so once we research all of those factors, and we decide what's best for not only our management goals, but for safety and for the surrounding habitat, we put it into a prescription. And so an example of one of these on the right is, you know, our prescription says that we want the wind that day to be between three and eight miles per hour, and it has to be coming out of the southwest. Um, temperature within 32 to 75 degrees, relative humidity, the type of fuel. And so, this prescription is so thought out and planned ahead uh, for safety and for management goals that if just one of those things that day, when we take weather and we check all of these parameters, if just one of those things is out of prescription, we don't do the fire. Um, and so it gets canceled. And that's happened uh, a couple of times where We've planned for a fire, we've gotten all of our crew mobilized, driven a couple hours to a site, have everything ready, and we had to call it off. And I'll call it off every time because it means, <laughs> it means you know, if we stick to our prescription, it means that we're, we're staying safe. If we're out of our prescription, things could happen and nobody wants that. 
And so lastly, um, our crew, we don't just get a bunch of people together and say, hey, let's go do some fire. Our crew goes through some pretty rigorous training um, and gets certifications, and we go through a pack test to be able to test physical ability on a fire. Um, but there are so many resources out there um, to learn more about prescribed fire. Like I said, fire science is an entire, um, you can get a degree in it. There's so much research out there about preparation, best management practices, um, safety and control, and education and training. And so with that said, I'm going to plug in the Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council, which is a, a group of professional conservation agencies and uh, private conservation agencies that uh, come together and try to use and share resources for prescribed fire. And so I'm actually a committee chair on that council. And if you have any interest in learning more about prescribed fire or learning about training, um, you can contact me or visit our website, which is um, listed on the screen. The top is Nature Preserve's website and the bottom one is for the fire council.